Hi, a very good morning or good afternoon to all of you. I'm Ivan, the Scientific Affairs Manager of Serbia APEC. Today we'll be talking about uh, capillary electrophoresis and especially about uncovering disease signs in the blood. I would welcome you to ask questions, post questions in the questions chat box, uh, box along the way. And just in case we are not able to answer all of your questions, please feel free to contact me via my email as well after the session. So before we can talk about capillary electrophoresis, it's important to understand the tradition about it. So the word phoresis in Greek actually means to be bring along. So in that sense, electrophoresis is actually to carry your molecules through that electric uh, voltage. So traditionally, electrophoresis is very much done on the agarose gel or in other gel contexts. For capillary electrophoresis, it will be done without that gel medium. Okay, so that's the main difference uh, between these two methods. And one very important concept for us to understand also is that all the protein species that are present in our samples, they, their charge can actually be varied in different pH conditions. Okay, so if you are to look even simply at the amino acid, as an example, you will see that above the isoelectric point at a more alkaline pH, your species will be a more negatively charged one. Okay, and below the isoelectric point, the protein would then be a more positively charged one. So in the case of capillary electrophoresis, you will also see later that we are dealing with more negatively charged species. And the reason is because the buffer that is inside the capillary is of an alkaline pH. So if we compare it with the agarose gel electrophoresis, the gel methods used traditionally will always have that matrix material. And it is the matrix material with its possessed channels and pores that separates the molecules based on their charge, size, and shape. However, in the case of capillary electrophoresis, what happens is you totally do not have the presence of the matrix material. And your sample is actually migrating through a free solution. It is actually an electrolyte buffer, all right? And Within that capillary surface, it is made up of silicium in the form of silicon dioxide. The special attributes of the capillary electrophoresis is that the setup is run on a very high voltage. It utilizes a very small capillary. In fact, the diameter of that capillary could even be less than 25 microns. You're looking at something that is even finer than the diameter of your hair. Okay, and given that the capillary is of such a minimal volume, you could expect the temperature control to be very tight and excellent. So when other methodologies for separation might have problems with temperature control in terms of the column, capillary electrophoresis fine-tunes this issue with a very fine volume in place. So what you could expect from a capillary electro for this type of separation would be excellent resolution and also a very fast and efficient separation, saving that uh, time. So how does the capillary electrophoresis principle work? You might be wondering now, why is there a picture of a travelator on the bottom right of the slide? You probably will have missed this image for the longest time you know, in the airports. However, you also understand how the capillary electrophoresis is actually very similar in principle to the travelator. Okay, once again, we have a very fine capillary that uh, is light with silicium. So understand that this silicium silicon dioxide uh, 
during in an environment of an alkaline pH, what happens is that it is deprotonated. It loses its hydrogen ions and it becomes a solid phase negatively charged surface, which means that this negatively charged surface, as you could see in the diagram, is immovable. It's fixed. And the samples, they are always tested in the capillary electrophoresis would be injected on the anodic site of the capillary, right? And sample detection would always be on the cathodic site of the capillary. So given the buffer conditions of alkaline pH, and also the uh, turning on of the electric field with the anode and the cathode, what will happen is that positive charges will actually align with the stationary negative surface, as you are now seeing in the diagram. All right, you can imagine the positive charges to be exactly like the travelator path, all right? It is mobile, unlike the stationary phase negatively charged. It is mobile and it will actually move and it will actually pull the solution along with it by how a travelator does that. So this pulling of the solution, this phenomenon, we will call it the electroendoosmotic flow. Also bear in mind that the electric field is still applicable to this setup. And the electric field's direction will be from the negative cathode towards the positive anode, all right? So what happens is that there is a bigger force of the electroendoosmotic flow going against the smaller force of the electric field. So what happens is that when your, when your test sample is injected into the system, while they are made negatively charged because of the alkaline environment, the species that are more negatively charged will be drawn back more by the positive anode. Although the overall electroendoosmotic flow, which is stronger, will still push all the test species right, towards the cathodic site to be detected. So all these test samples will, uh, these test species would actually come out from the capillary in a different time owing to this these different movements within these forces. And they are differently detected at different times at the cathode site. Okay. So you could imagine like some children that you see playing on the travelator, they try to go against the direction of the travelator. Okay, these will be likened to the very negatively charged species that you see in purple in the diagram. No matter how they try to run against the direction of the travelator, they are still pushed to the other side. Okay, so try to imagine that for your better understanding. Okay, and, and as a result, uh, what is detected as a cathode would then give rise to a profile, a capillary electrophoresis profile that's seen on the little diagram on the left. It looks like a spectrum. So the important thing to note about capillary electrophoresis style of migration is that it is the bulk solution that's actually migrating. So what happens is that the whole solution moves as an entire volume. So what does this imply? It implies that whenever you use the capillary electrophoresis, you are actually looking at a migration of a solution that has a very flat front okay and this is contrasted with the case of migrating a solution when you actually apply pressure in the middle of the solution front which often is the case in scenarios of hydrodynamic pumping or instances of using the high pressure liquid chrom chromatography right you would expect uh, a pressure-induced migration to give rise to a curved front. 
pay versus a solution a bulk solution migration that is dragged along the tracks of the travelator, like in the case of capillary electrophoresis. So when there is a parabolic flow profile in your migration, what happens is that like in this instance, if we look at the exact scenario of a hemoglobin S, which is for sickle cell disease, you would actually see many of the spectrums overlapping because of the parabolic flow profile. Whereas in the case of capillary electrophoresis, what you see is a very fine separation because of the flat flow profile. So in the same scenario of the same uh, disease type, you actually see a more resolved, a higher resolution separation of the hemoglobin, the normal hemoglobin and the variant hemoglobin, Okay, as you can see uh, in the two major peaks in the diagram on the right. So how do we apply capillary electrophoresis to uncover diseases in the blood? Right, it can be applied to the context of both adult and also newborn. So most of the hemoglobin disorders, in fact, by the nature of how they are passed down in terms of the genetics, we would expect many people who do not have symptoms in the society to actually pass down part of the genes to the future population. And most of these people would be healthy carriers, asymptomatic carriers, we call them the heterozygotes. And uh, when they produce offsprings, there is a one quarter chance, a 25% chance of an offspring having the full bone disorder because of the combination of both of the disease genes. And also 50% of the time, the genes will continue to pass down through asymptomatic carriers as well. So there is much importance in the sense of testing the hemoglobin and for blood disorders for situations of like premarital counseling or instances of looking at the, the newborn or looking at somebody who probably has a heterozygote gene <coughs> or a full bone combination of the genes. For the current usage of uh, hemoglobin testing for newborn screening, it is also possible to have it done with dried blood spots on the Guthrie card. Uh, such sample collections could also be subjected to capillary electrophoresis style of separation. Okay, so to understand the genetic background of the newborns is important so that uh, one can prepare for proper treatment and to avoid complication should any of the symptoms arise later in life. So looking at the hemoglobin fraction of a normal adult on the capillary electrophoresis profile, you can see that the various hemoglobin forms are being separated very well in high resolution. Okay, you see the majority hemoglobin APIC and also the minority hemoglobins like the fetal hemoglobins and the hemoglobin A2. So let's talk about, let's use a very classic textbook examples to understand uh, potential usage of capillary electrophoresis for screening for hemoglobin variants. So sickle cell disease is a commonly known disease. It may not be that greatly present in our region, Southeast Asia or APAC. However, predictions would have it that in a couple of decades forward, there will be a substantial increase in the number of sickle cell disease carriers and patients in our region because of immigration, right? So using this example, we also understand the current context of uh, COVID. Very often patients might come under scenarios whereby there is deoxygenation uh, circumstances, like for example, in the respiratory failure context. So in such instances, the sickle cell hemoglobin is actually known to polymerize. So this is basically a hemoglobin that has just a single mutation that changes the chemical properties of the hemoglobin. However, patients or carriers of them may not feel anything in normal circumstances because this polymerization only happens under certain extreme 
circumstances. So it's always good to know their genetic background to prepare for the possibility of medical treatment. So with the recent uh, COVID surge in many places, there are also increasing articles that actually talk about uh, case studies of even patients who, who have underlying sickle cell traits and uh, when faced with COVID, an understanding of that trait actually helped decide on the different type of treatment, like the usage of blood transfusion, which actually helped some of them exit from hospitalization when they were originally having a severe disease, as opposed to conventional treatment approaches, for example. So what the sickle cell gene also does is that it causes the sickling and it might cause the red blood cells to lyse and causing hemolysis and resulting in anemia as well. Okay, it can also lead to vaso-occlusive effects and all these symptoms do not always happen but they may occasionally become a medical emergency. Okay, and this can actually lead to reduced oxygen flow to our peripheral organs and tissues which then can lead to, uh, to a wider complication than the original problem itself. So the other hemoglobin variants that are present, they are more commonly present in our region, they also function in a similar way like how they were caused, like the sickle cell, to have uh, single mutations in their hemoglobins. Some of these examples are, for example, hemoglobin D, E, and C, or hemoglobin Lepore, okay? And if combined with any sickle cell trait might actually lead to a, a worse disease, all right? So capillary electrophoresis actually allows one to have clear visibility to any of these variant forms. Okay, you could see in this case, looking at the sickle cell as an example, you can see a very clear migration of the sickle cell hemoglobin in that defined zone. So in the case of other variants, you will actually see that migration of the peak in another specific position. And this is an example if the patient actually has a, fu a full-blown disease because of this homozygous trait. You can clearly also see that the patient do not have the normal hemoglobin, but fully possess the sickle cell hemoglobin. Okay, so if you were to use the capillary electrophoresis and look at other kinds of hemoglobin variants which could constitute a disease. The advantages of capillary electrophoresis is because of the resolution, we are looking at very clear cut position migrations of the different variants, which even come in the form of an arbitrary number in the system, which you are able to differentiate between different variant forms. Okay. So not limiting to sickle cell disease, one is actually able to even look at all other variants, okay? And this is an ongoing library list as newer variants are being discovered and added on to that database list when using capillary electrophoresis. If the blood disorder is a thalassemia-based type of disorder, you're also able to use the capillary electrophoresis to identify them. So if you look at the uh, picture, you're actually looking at the golf inclusion bodies of a red blood cell smear staining, all right? This is actually attributed to a hemoglobin H that's present in the major alpha thalassemia. So clearly, this hemoglobin H species also presents itself as a very resolved band in the capillary electrophoresis profile here, okay? One could also use the capillary electrophoresis to look at other factors in the blood, for example, increased glucose in the scenario of diabetes. Okay. So in the past, most of the diabetic tests would require a person to fast and to actually not have any meals before the testing. Currently, you might actually know that diabetic diabetes tests do not actually require that fasting. The reason is because they look at a sugar-coated version of the hemoglobin in the blood. So what happens is that the red blood cells that are exposed to the glucose undergoes a chemical modification over a period of three months. So this is a long-term process and the chemical reaction is not an enzymatic one. It happens slowly over time. 
So given this period of time, you can actually monitor the high glucose level of the blood and the status of it in the last three months. So that is how diabetes could be monitored by looking at HbA1c. And in short, if you use the capillary electrophoresis to look at HbA1c, it actually presents itself as a clearly resolved band in the diagram on the left. Okay, so this is a species of hemoglobin A0 that is glycated. So when you glycate the hemoglobin A0 because of the glucose, which happens in the blood, it becomes the HbA1c and it moves away from the HbA0 as shown in this separation. And the formula that's being used to calculate HbA1c for diabetes is actually the same formula that has been used in the IFCC standardization methods, which could also be converted into the NGSP measurement results, which are also shown when capillary electrophoresis is used to measure HbA1c. So furthermore, capillary electrophoresis could also be used uh, to look at the blood serum for in the context of my multiple myeloma and also immune disorders. So multiple myeloma is a, actually a cancer of the plasma cells in the bone marrow. So it's also called a liquid tumor, not like a solid tumor. All right. So the plasma cells are actually the immune cells that are differentiated to produce antibodies for us in any form of infections, to fight any form of infections. However, when these cells become cancerous, they continue to pro produce the antibodies. And because cancer is a clonal disease, you would expect a monoclonal antibody to be produced by these cancer cells. In simple terms, one of the normal plasma cells becomes cancerous and it multiplies into a huge population and it continues to produce the same type of antibody knowing that in our body we have a whole ocean of other antibodies so this single antibody would then show itself up in the blood okay. as multiple myeloma produces a lot of long-term implications like very severe symptoms like including bone fractures kidney damage and anemia and most of the time to diagnose multiple myeloma you have to resort to very invasive methods like biopsy for example however using the blood serum it represents a very simple test that's minimally invasive just looking at the blood you are able to identify the monoclonal antibody right so the blood is being taken and it's allowed to clot, which gives you the serum, which is the yellow solution sitting above the red blood cells as seen in the picture. So when you run this serum in the capillary electrophoresis, it will give you a profile separation of the serum. The antibodies are actually located on the gamma portion on the furthest right. And the, this separation also allows you to look at other fractions that are present in the uh, serum as well okay and by looking at the changes of the serum you are also able to identify other diseases related to immunity or inflammation in the blood besides multiple myeloma right so this is an example of a multiple myeloma uh, patient serum who actually has a monoclonal pig as you can see in the gamma portion of the profile, there is a sharp peak that arises. Okay. And capillary electrophoresis is also able to further find out what this monoclonal peak is, what type of antibody it is, because we know that within our antibodies, we have the different antibody forms, the most common being IgG, and then the less common being other antibody isotypes like IgA and IgM. And to know the antibody isotype, like for example, IgA, will allow you to, to understand that the disease may have a worse prognosis, for example. Therefore, it's important for us to understand which isotype it is for the patient. And also importantly for us to continue to monitor the patient in the course of the disease treatment to see if the cancer is actually reduced such that the monoclonal antibody of that isotype is lost. All right, so these are also the capabilities of the capillaries electrophoresis. So with that, uh, I conclude my talk and 
really hope to answer some of the questions that you guys will have. I would also welcome you to use the QR code to access a survey form as I would really hope to uh, seek your feedback about this session. Okay, I have a question from the audience. Uh, thank you so much for asking this question. So let me read out the question. For all the capillary electrophoresis, regardless of whether is it testing for hemoglobinopathy or HbA1c, the condition is alkaline solution. Okay, uh, my answer would be for the context of uh, human-related testing, most of the time it will be the alkaline condition. So I may not be able to answer this in the uh, instances of other analytical processes because it, it may depend on the analytical chemistry needs. But in the case of human-related testings like hemoglobinopathies or HbA1c, uh, just bear in mind that our normal human physiological pH is about near to the neutral pH of 7 plus. So if the condition of the capillary is in an alkali solution, it will more likely mean that our proteins will be more negatively charged in that case. I, I hope that answers uh, your question. Thank you. We have another question here. Thanks for your question also. So it is, uh, how is immunosubtraction done in terms of the principle and how it is better or not than immunofixation? Okay, I will have uh, other webinar series in future talking more in depth about this. But in answer to, to your question, so what happens in immunosubtraction is that uh, you, so both immunosubtraction and immunofixation involves adding of the anti sever to the samples. Okay, in the case of immunofixation, you actually, the antibodies will precipitate out the IGs in their test sample, and then it, they will be fixed in the gel. However, for immunosubtraction, because of the capillary electrophoresis separation, whatever is precipitated in your sample because of the anti serum mixture will actually migrate away because the anti serum is a very negative antibody. So you will add a lot of negative charge to that antibody that is targeting. Okay, for example, IgG, then the anti serial against IgG will cause the immune complex to form. And this, this immune complex is actually much more negative. And as described earlier, they will be drawn towards the uh, cathodic end of the separation. So they will actually go beyond even albumin in the serum protein separation, which is why you don't see them in the gamma portion, but they actually come out of the separation earlier. Okay, so how is it better than immunofixation? Uh, capillary electrophoresis grants a very high resolution that cannot be attainable within the gel, right? So you are able to better separate out your species. You are better able to see a, a faint monoclonal band, for example, okay? However, the strength of immunofixation is that if you have a very, very small quantity of a monoclonal band, the staining principle of immunofixation is actually able to amplify your signal to give you a good thing. So this is the major uh, principle differences between immunosubtraction and immunofixation. I would say each has its strengths and they do complement for one person uh, for the tester to understand how that monoclonal, monoclonality of the sample is. Which means that if you suspect monoclonality and using one system, if you're not able to get a result, using the other one will complement it. I hope that actually answers your question.
Are there any further questions in the audience? Okay, if not, just feel free to uh, send me your questions if you have any further questions after this session. And really appreciate your time here today. And uh, given our time limit of the webinar of 30 minutes, I will, I will end the webinar now. It's really great to have a session with you guys. Thank you all and uh, should we meet soon again. Thank you very much. Have a good day ahead. Take care.